And welcome to the SpartanMag.com VCast Jim Carpenter, Paul Konerdike. Hockey night in Grand Rapids. Michigan State beat Fair State 4-1. to Great Lakes Invitational semifinal. Michigan State will play Michigan Tech Friday, 7 o'clock. Grand Rapids, Van Andel Arena. A lot of fun here in Grand Rapids tonight. A little bit of change in pace. Unable to do the VCast with the rink in the background. We're doing it from the press room, so it'll be pretty good. But nice change of pace. Talk a little hockey tonight. And uh, maybe some other things we'll have to wait and see. But... Um, Interesting to get out here and watch these number seven ranked Spartans uh, play today. They improved to 13, 4, and 2, I think. Uh, Fair State under 500. Michigan Tech's 9 and 8. Plenty of tickets available. Uh, should be a good time down here on Friday uh, to check that one out. We won't have a VCast after the championship game, but it's good to get uh, to touch base with Michigan State hockey at this point right now with a little bit of breather with some of the other sports going on. Paul, what did you think about it today? I mean, Michigan State had a red hot start last year, right, with, with, a, with a pretty decent team, a team that kind of hit its head on the ceiling at times, did a pretty good job. Uh, this, to me, like, I mean, it showed how much Michigan State's coming in the span of a year in terms of building depth, program building. Um, they had some good pieces last year, but what we saw today was a good team because this Ferris team, you know, yeah, they're under under 500 right now, but they're well coached. Uh, they play hard and uh, and they have good expectations, and they expected to beat Michigan State last year, and it, they got out to a hot start. I believe it was like two nothing in the first period last year. It was the flip side of that with, with Michigan State this year. You know, Ferris had a couple early shots, had a power play early, and then Michigan State, the skill, the athleticism, um, the improved depth just took over. And uh, I think at one at one point, you know, like Ferris had like five one shot advantage to start out with, and then uh -huh. and then it was like at one point it was like thirty to, you know, thirty to seven, thirty to nine favoring mm -hmm. Michigan State, and it just seemed like every time Ferris had something going that would have worked last year uh a puck got poked away here and there and i, I thought michigan state he just showed you they're all around depth better lines uh, deeper lines more skill more talent um, more cohesion uh, you know defensemen in better position than they were at times last year fewer stupid penalties fewer like stupid fighting type penalties yeah that gets you hurt in today's college hockey game more discipline year, I, I yeah. thought you know like michigan state did a really nice uh, job tonight, and if they can win this GLI thing, I think this event will take one more step towards kind of becoming not what it was back in the Ron Mason, uh, you know, Red Barons days. It's never going to get back there when that was a huge deal where both of these teams were like national powers. You know, it's not going to be like that, but it can get to be a pretty good event that brings a lot of people out. And there were more Michigan State fans this year. I think the Spartan brand is building back. But if they win this thing, in addition to uh, – and they finish strong in the second half of the season, it's really going to – I think Michigan State hockey is um, – it's obviously a buy right now, but it's really building in terms of excitement. And I think it's being built for the – for the long haul. And it's good that Michigan State is good right now because if they were trying to move the GLI to Grand Rapids five, six, seven years ago when Michigan State was really struggling or three years ago without the Michigan-Michigan State rivalry aspect of it, it would have been a tougher sell. But like you said, more Michigan State fans in my estimation for the semifinal this year than last year. Western Michigan not being in it, you don't have, you don't have the Bronco fans here. Last year when Michigan State played Ferris, there were quite a few number of Western Michigan fans who stayed for the second game, at least for the first two periods to see who they were going to play the next day. And then the Michigan Tech fans always stay because they love hockey. Um, no Western Michigan this year. They'll be in it next year. I think you wrote something. It'll be at SpartanMag.com. Also, uh, like the channel here. Subscribe to the channel. Go to SpartanMag.com. Become a subscriber. The, the Western uh, fan base is a lot bigger than people realize. You think for hockey? I mean, yeah, in and in general. I mean, in terms of alumni base, I, several of my family members, um, you know, because most of those people are from a teaching background, but Western's got a great education college. And, um, you know, Kelman's would be an hour away. Um, hockey's always been a big deal for them mm -hmm. for a long time, and uh, and it was a lot quieter in that second game tonight than it would have been otherwise. Now it wasn't near as exciting as a game as Michigan State played against Ferris last year. That was a that was a good game, but there's no doubt in my mind that Western travels better, has a sure. bigger brand in hockey than Ferris does. Yeah. No, no disre disrespect to Ferris because it's right. a good program. Yeah, uh, but but Western being. I mean, he's got a large alumni base. Mm -hmm. This is a West Michigan event, and you need to have a West Michigan university here, Western Michigan University. And it's a, Kalamazoo's a good hockey town, has been for a long time. They support the Broncos. They hunger to play Michigan State. It would have been riled up to see Michigan State and Mich or to see Michigan State and Western Michigan last year or this year, and That's not going to see it. I mean, I just looked it up for the story I just wrote, but but Western Michigan is the number twelve team in the GLI. They've got 
Um, you know, they've got a really good win over a top five Denver team. Number 12 team in. In, in the pairwise rankings. They've got a, a good win over a top five Denver team, and, uh, yeah. and they've got a close loss to that same Denver team. That, so they beat them like 7-3, to three, and then they lost to them in overtime. Yeah, this you is know, the, the third, third straight year Western Michigan's been a borderline top 10 team. So, yeah, they should be in this. That would be a lot of fun. No disrespect to Ferris. But uh, for the for this event it, to to become even more of a holiday staple bef- between Christmas and New Year's as it's been for years and years in Detroit, it can be good here. I guess what I what I would avoid is, I mean, and I don't want to be disrespectful. Alaska, Alaska, they're not Alaska Fairbanks anymore for you old timers out there like myself. But no disrespect to them either. But if you're going to rotate a te- like if you're going to bring in and you're going to make a big deal like you want to rotate a team in there, Alaska is not the team to bring in. Uh, you, you try to bring in like a Notre Dame or a, you know like something else like a like Quinnipiac or something like that. Boston University. You, I'm just saying if you're going to if you're going to have the model where you want to rotate a team in, mm-hmm. you want to rotate a good team in here to give it a little sure. extra flavor. I think I think uh, Notre Dame's going to be in either I think in two years with Western and Michigan State and Tech. So uh, Michigan State doing their part winning this game today. Uh, you know Bob Daniels, the coach for Ferris State. Uh, he's a Michigan State grad. He played at Michigan State years ago. 29th year as Ferris State's head coach. They beat the Spartans, of course, last year. And Ferris State's has, uh, you know, with their style, they've been a problem for Michigan State on occasion over the years. I asked him what he thought of Michigan State this year compared to last year. And I think that video might be here on the, the Spartan Mag YouTube channel somewhere. But I thought his he, he gave some long thought out answers, and I thought there were, there was a really good quote. For, they're in my story as well, but basically he's impressed with the depth of Michigan State, something we've been talking about most of the year. He thought the defensemen were good, not flashy, but consistently really good. And he liked, the, he was impressed with the way Michigan State kept pressure in Ferris State's defensive zone, and that's a four check. Michigan State with the quickness and the structure and conditioning, those are things Nightingale's been talking about for more than a year and a half. He, he's, and he's brought in for recruiting whether it be freshmen or through the transfer portal, a lot of guys with short area quickness that routinely and uh, over and over win 50-50 pucks, win loose pucks, quicker to the puck, quickness, quickness, quickness on the four check within the structure. And he's talked, everybody conditions, but Nightingale thinks that Michigan State conditions better than anybody, and they want to be that way and play that way. And the conditioning kind of kind of shows up if you play with that quickness. They did that to Notre Dame three weeks ago, had the four check and kept it on them, and then uh, – you know, Notre Dame's a better team than Fair State. Fair State, not as good of a team, really had trouble with it. Daniels pointed that out today. He's impressed with Michigan State. He says they're more more cohesive than last year. And that's kind of where he left it. But you can tell he was impressed with Michigan State. Yeah, I think but the, the thing that kind of impresses me is not only, you know, like last year when you were ta- telling me about the style of hockey they wanted to play, you could see that. And you could see what they wanted to do with passing and, you know, the skill level. But the, now you're seeing a team that does it cohesively. So it, it's not like if you miss a pass, you're giving up a, a breakaway. You're starting to see – Michigan State, the conditioning show up when they play teams like a Minnesota, you yeah, know, or on, on like a bigger sheet of ice. And, and last year, Michigan State was just not ready to play those type of teams. Yeah. Like Minnesota really exposed Michigan State in a lot of ways, and and they weren't able to play as as well as able to play some of the more physical teams. And that physicality piece isn't hurting Michigan State as much as you know it did last year. So um, you can kind of see the direction Michigan State is building, and it's kind of it's it's fun. And, and guys are still playing. You know, they play. A, a faster style, but they still play, uh, you know, a rugged style at times. You see guys going down and blocking stuff on the, on the on the ice, and you know, so it's not like a selfish style. Mm-hmm. Um, in and fact, tonight at times, there I think some guys were too unselfish. Yeah, Levshinov one time had a, a chance uh, in front and passed it to someone else. Didn't get a real good shot off, but Levshinov at six two defenseman and Patrick Geary six one freshman defenseman. They've got some size and they throw it around a little bit. Um, Second string goalie Luca DePasco from Livonia, Michigan, sitting in for Trey Augustine, who's over in Sweden with Team USA in the World Junior Championships. And it was DePasco's second start of the year. Pretty good, 4-1. to one. Got some early work. You know, like you said, Ferris outshot Michigan State 5-1 to one early on. That allowed DePasco to get some early work, settle into it, and he was pretty good all night. And uh, he'll have to be good against Tech also. He had one really good save in that power play where, you know, early, early on, early on yeah. where it was like a – I mean, it was way too wide open of a shot. Uh-huh. And, uh, and he – that's a that's a goal that would have gone in last year. I feel like with like and that's what, exactly what happened when Ferris with Ferris last year. They got a couple 
really good shots, hard shots that went went in, and then and then you know like Michigan State was playing catch up all night. But I think that was a tone setter. Had Ferris got a power play goal, uh, who knows what a, what would have happened? But because Michigan State was able to to kill that penalty to start right, to start the game off, uh, then they were able to settle in, and that skill was able to show up. Yeah. Because initially, the first five minutes or so, Michigan State didn't look like they were supremely. You're talented. They looked a little bit rusty, mm-hmm. and and then they settled in, and the skill and the and the athleticism and 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 all those things started taking over. All right, let's shift gears a little bit. I was at Michigan State's basketball practice today. They've been practicing, uh, you know, for the last few days as they get ready to play Indiana State on the 30th, which is going to be a difficult team. Indiana State is an excellent mid-major team, the best team they've had maybe in 20 or 30 years. Good team coming out of the Missouri Valley. Um, They'll shoot threes like crazy. Izzo is concerned about this game. Izzo said today that Indiana State throws backdoor passes better than any team he's ever coached against. And Michigan State made a call out to fans uh, to come out and support Michigan State. He says this is not the usual you know, holiday-type game against a non-conference opponent. It's going to be very difficult. If Michigan State gets a win there, that uh, – that that um, it, that'll take some doing, and it'll be good good sign for Michigan State. In the meantime, practice of course today without Jeremy Fears, um, the, the the terrible thing that happened with him being involved, being uh, as you know, w- was shot on the night of uh, December twenty second, early morning December twenty third. He's returning to Michigan State, returning to campus on Friday. As O said that uh, you know they they'll have the Michigan State specialists working with him and having a, a hand in his re- he, he will be rehabbing and uh, recovering at Michigan State he was hitting the femur with that thing which so when you get a bone situation like that Izzo says you never know they expect a full reco- recovery but they never really know certainly a sobering situation so happy that Jeremy Fears is okay um, but the team's moving on without him uh, we'll talk about basketball here a little bit which is secondary to all of that but Today, you know, Trey Holloman making the transition to be, to playing more point guard now. When Fears came in, Holloman played more and became more of a, a wing guard. You know, and sometimes he would push it, and sometimes he'd end up with the ball at the end of a shot clock and do some point guard things. Now he has to get back to being more of a quarterback. There was some rust today in his quarterback skills, but that's something that needs to come along quickly because the 15 minutes that they're going to be losing without Fears, those 15 minutes of point guard will be going to Holloman, most likely. Ho- Hogard might play a little bit more. It all, it, we'll have to see how it all pans out. But Michigan State uh, in a little bit of transition there as their their um, playing group is altered. I'm not worried about point guard with with Holloman. He showed last year as a true freshman that he can run the team. I think he's better this year. But it it is a, when you train yourself from going from the one last year to the two and all the different things that you have to do in terms of you know running the floor, all that type of stuff, there is – there is a uh, you know there is a transition back, especially it's not like Trey Holloman's a veteran player. It's not like it's Tyson Walker, who started out playing point guard, you know, plays a lot of two now, obviously, and you could probably ask him to go back to the point, and it would be easier for him to to mentally manage the do du- the two the duality of the two positions. For Trey Holloman, it's going to take a couple practices, and these are these are critical for him. But but I think Trey Holloman is a uh, you know he's shown me enough on ball that. Um, uh, you, you don't want anything like what happened to Fierce to ever ha- happen. But if you look at what Michigan State has depth-wise, that's the one position where I think uh, you know they, they can afford it. Now it's it's a tragedy on a personal level, and it's a really terrible thing for a young man who is very talented, has a chance to I believe be one of the all-time you know great Michigan State point guards if he continues to develop and continues to work um, as he, as he has an engaging young man, one of the kind of most. Uh, I don't know how to describe him, but he has an infectious personality, and uh, he's one of those guys that people want to be around mm-hmm. um, in, in a positive way. Um, you know, so I, I feel for him and his family. I know that you know both of us have uh, you know teenage sons, and uh, you know I can I can't imagine what um, what they you know getting that call, something like that. You know, especially with a family that's away on a recruiting trip with their yeah. other brother, it, it's just a terrible situation. But Michigan State has the personnel to overcome this i just pray for uh, jeremy fears that he will uh you know make a, a speedy recovery I, i'm glad that they're saying that it's going to be three months and he's not going to try to rush back onto the onto the floor i think you know right now not only do you have the physical hurdle but there's going to be a big mental hurdle and uh and it's going to take time but so, yeah. but i'm glad that i'm glad that he's able to come back to michigan state he's able to take advantage of the resources that michigan state has and you know 
there's nobody in that program that doesn't want Jeremy Fears to succeed. So it's uh, it's going to be a long road back. But I think he's surrounded by the right people, and uh, and I don't think anyone's heard the last Jeremy Fears because he's a he's a dynamic human being. Right. I'm so glad he's okay. I mean, yeah. we've had so many things go wrong that I'm just so glad he's okay, All right, and he's going to get better soon. That's great. Um, Jackson Kohler, um, not full fledged practicing yet. Uh, you know, he was doing strength work today. Izzo says he's involved with shooting and some of the drills. He's hoping he can return to practice next week, but he won't be back for this game and, may, and likely not the next one either. And they, they, they could use him. Um, with Holloman moving more to the point, Izzo says that opens up, you know, where Holloman used to be playing a lot of off guard. Now they, they're going to need Cohen Carr to play more of those minutes at the off guard position. And. Normally call? Well, yeah, they, he didn't mention that because, you know, they need Hall of the Four because. Behind him, you know, Carr's been doing some of that, and they, right. they keep working with Booker. But um, so Carr playing a little bit more on the, on the perimeter, and they're, um, he had a good practice today. Carr's got some juice in his legs. Everybody knows that, and his game could continue to, to develop rapidly. But Michigan State, big one against Indiana State coming up this weekend. That's going to be a, a tough test for the, for the Spartans. Did you happen to see how Malik Hall shot in practice today? Yeah. Because that, that's the one thing that – you want to look at long, long term, and I'll go back to the last game that they played. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, they did everything right. Uh, Malik Hall, what, he was two for six or whatever from behind the three point line, turned down several open shots. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and you know, got one in the corner, tried to jab step, and, and then he ended up taking the shot because he was wide open. But if you would have got it in rhythm and shot, it would have been a much better, better look. I mean, for Michigan State, so with Trey Holloman moving back, you know, to the one. And, you know, if Cohen Carr, who's not a perimeter shooter, if he's, you know, if it's going to be driving and stuff like that, you can't, a guy like that can't drive, um, you know, or, or have too much traffic. So you've got to have the, you've got to have the stretch four element. Mm -hmm. And that makes it all the more important. You know, you and I have talked about this several times. And I know that Malik Hall is never going to be Joey Hauser. Mm -hmm. And nor, you know, nor should anyone expect him to be. But he's got to be enough of a perimeter shooter to stretch the floor. And that means no hesitation, taking open shots. And uh, for Michigan State to be a really good team, he's got to be able to shoot that ball. So we, you talk about different things that, that need to happen in this program, but that's the one thing that I would have my eye on consistently because, in my opinion, if he continues to turn down open shots, uh, you know, Michigan State is going to be victimized at some point by a team that gets red-hot shooting. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you can't – and you can't catch up to him. It's harder for Tyson Walker to be Tyson Walker if teams are sagging off of Hogard, sagging off of your foreman, and if Carr's in there sagging off of him, it just makes it harder on Walker. Walker saw that against Oakland. And it, it's not just on offense. You know, like Tyson Walker is going to find a ways to score. We know that, but he's a dynamic, elite defender um, when he's you know when he's rested. When, but the harder he has to work to get his shot on offense, yeah. the less effective he is a, as a defensive player. So. I think Malik Hall has shown to me that he can do a lot of good things even when he's not hitting threes. Mm -hmm. But for this team to be an elite top five team, he's got to be able to knock down open jumpers yeah. on the perimeter. And uh, that's that's my biggest thing, um, mm -hmm. you know, when you look at Big Ten play. Because yep. how many – like whenever Michigan State's – not whenever because they, they did get it done it with Brandon Dawson not being a good three-point shooter. You know, but that's rare. For Michigan State to be the best version of its offense, for Michigan State to get – take advantage of as many guys that can drive, they've got to be – the floor has got to be spread. Mm -hmm. And you and can't do that with a – you can't do that with a four <clears throat> where you've got Greg Campy saying to his guys, back up, mm -hmm. you know, make him shoot. And then him not shooting, him yeah. driving into the defense. And I'm not sure where his confidence is. You know, he's a guy that's not always been the most confidence player. He's always been working on right. that and giving him some support. Um, Malik Hall's doing a lot of good things defensively, played real well exactly. against Bridges when they beat Baylor, uh, well against Townsend against Oakland. He's playing good defense. He's back to the back. I mean, that's one of the things, the defensive defense. communication against Baylor, I, I, that's the one thing that I noticed. Uh, guys were talking a whole lot more. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll give Malik Hall credit for this because Xavier Booker is not playing as many minutes as he is without Malik Hall being on the floor with him, telling him exactly what to do, what mm -hmm. he's not doing. And if Malik Hall wasn't doing that, Xavier Booker wouldn't be able to play. And Booker's getting a little bit better, a little bit better today. Malik Hall's doing a good job of defense, doing a good job with his post-up, uh, good job with medium range. If he has the ball, you know, shot clock winding down, 
um, it's it's not a terrible situation. I'm not saying he can like go get buckets like an All American, but he can do a lot of good things. Right. And he's shot well from beyond the arc earlier in his career. Um, this year, not 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 so good so far. I agree. It's Big a component. It's a commitment thing, though, because you got to be like you got to know like in the second half of the last game out after he had the went two for four or two for six or whatever in the first half. The first three he got in the corner after he got chewed up for the jab step move. Uh, he shot without thinking, and he made that three. So I know it's still there. I know you can do it, but it's got to be a commitment. It's got to be consistent. Mm-hmm. It can't be, I'll show you I can do it. It, it, it has to be like, when it's there, I need to take this because mm-hmm. that's what I can do to help my team. You, yeah. Those those fadeaways from the elbow, those are great in certain situations, but you're not. those are low percentage shots mm-hmm. compared to a wide open three. And he makes those better than a lot of people. A lot of people don't even try those shots anymore, but he can, and he's provided that. But the three for that for that position in this offense, we say it every year, and I've been saying it all heading into the season and the off season that that would be something I'd be watching all year, and it has not come around. He's working on it, and he doesn't need to be Robert Ory or Dirk Nowitzki. He just needs to be Kenny Goins, right. you know, as a shooter, and that's 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 a ways off. I'm not sure it's going to get there, Paul, but he's working at it, and and we'll see what what uh, how that develops as we head into the new year. Well. Uh, one more game before the new year. As far as football goes, you know, the, the portal's still going on. You know, Michigan State getting Jerron Glover coming out of the portal, the wide receiver. Derek Harmon withdrawing from the transfer portal defensive tackle. Big one for Michigan State. I wrote in an analysis piece about that over at SpartMag.com about Harmon and what it means and Geno Vandermark coming out of the portal, offensive guard. You know, a week, week and a half ago, Paul, I thought that Vandermark and Derek Harmon were going to be gone. And I'm like, there, there's, you know, I'm not saying Vandermark's great, but it's not like you can just go to 7-Eleven and get another 320-pound offensive guard who's played seven or eight games. Vandermark uh, is is a commodity. It's useful. And in the portal, Oklahoma paid a lot of money for Spencer Brown. He's just a mediocre player. But that's what established big men can command in the portal. And you can bet that there were some offers out there for him. There definitely were big offers out there for Harmon. Michigan State got some act together in, in that regard, brought those two guys back. And those are important building blocks that uh, increase Michigan State's chances of having a, a you know a decent year next year. Without those guys, the rebuilding project gets knocked back some. There's still the Mich- still more that Michigan State's going to be seeking in the portal. And I'll be interested to see what that develops into because they do a really good job keeping things quiet. But Derek Harmon, Glover, Vandermark, your thoughts about any of those three? Which ones do you think, uh, you know, which one piques your curiosity the most? Well, which, which one's the most newsworthy? What are your thoughts on those? I mean, Glover, it's great he's coming back, but he's a receiver. I, no offense to any receivers out there, but the, that position is dime a dozen in the portal. Those are guys you can replace. You cannot replace interior defensive linemen. I, I don't care. Harmon didn't have the year I expected him to have. He wasn't as good, but the fact that he went out there and got official visits to Oregon, you know, to Ohio State, and where else, wherever well, else Auburn he wanted him. I don't know if he went to Auburn or not, but they right. wanted but him. But the fact that he's out there and he's a commodity, and, and, and you know that he was being recruited throughout this process. Yes. You know, like, so having a 300-pounder that has has soft feet, can move, um, is coachable, uh, is, is, you know, it's priceless. And You know, I think the one thing that this allows Michigan State to do, um, I'm not sure if they're going to be able to get any four-year guys or anything like that, but – if you get guys like that, veterans back, it allows you to, to put more resources into trying to get you know four year players, and that's what Michigan State absolutely needs. They cannot, you know. So let's say let's say Harmon does leave, and then you're, you're let's say you're grabbing some, you know some some re retreads or whatever you yeah. want to call it or At some best. some uh, you know Jared Jackson type yeah, Jalen you know Sami types you know you know Jalen Sami's a good good dude and he had a really productive good career good. you know at, at Colorado but I mean, I'm telling you guys like Maverick Hanson guys like you know like Derek Harmon that have already you know like understand the culture are are guys that are team first dudes mm-hmm. uh, Simeon Barrow I mean Simeon Barrow like he's no one's even like talking about him, but to have those guys stay is huge. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like I was telling you earlier today, oh. just talking about this. I, I was telling you, like, I was, anecdotally hearing stuff from other other coaching staffs and whatnot. Like, I heard the other day that uh, a team that's currently in the Pac uh, Pac twelve uh, had multi million dollars offered for their entire starting defensive line. Now, like, I, whether that's true or not, I have no idea. But the numbers that are getting thrown out there enough, or there's enough. Off of that kind of conjecture that that people are, um, you know, they're moving around and, or at least they're they're going out there. So, 
It's, t- it's tough. It's tough to keep guys together. It's tough to keep guys that want to be there. And for, for to have guys like Simeon Barrow, Derek Harmon, Maverick Hansen, having those guys want to, you know, to use the D'Antonio phrase, to, to complete their circles, yeah. that means a lot to me. And it's not, you know, those guys are players. Uh, are they great players? I don't they're valuable. Know, I don't know, they're but, they're, but they're players that you can't find, you know, you can't find in the portal and you can't yes. find in the junior college ranks. Nope. And, uh you might get lucky once in a while and get a high school guy that can that can start in in year one, but to have guys that are experienced know how to stop the run, mm-hmm. um, you know, know how to communicate and know how to play through some things mm-hmm. um, and uh, and play for their teammates. That's that's huge. And in terms of setting a culture for for your program, having those guys that have stuck it out and played as hard as they can through with nothing to play for. You can't replace guys like that. They're huge. Mm-hmm. And Simeon Barrow, of course, went into the portal in late October, early November, and then came back out. But there was a, a, a real chance that he could have left, a real chance that Harmon could have left. And if you take those two guys out with the way Michigan State has neglected to recruit defensive tackles the last three years, you know, Alex Van Sumeren has a chance to maybe become something. We've not seen him. We're not sure. But other than him, they've not recruited defensive tackles. And that really would have shown itself if the, these three guys hadn't come back. It's my understanding Han- Maverick Hansen's coming back. And uh, – a lot of a Hansen lot of experience. Said that he wants to come back. Yes, and, and they'll t- they're not going to say. No one's going to tell Maverick Hanson, a guy that's played played so many snaps at such a at such a quality level. No one's going to say, "Hey, we don't want you." No, no you no. want that guy. Yeah, he's a program guy. He's a battler, and they'll have those three guys, and, and it's so important. And that, that'll help for sure. I like Glover a lot. You know, he got off to a real good start against Central Michigan early in the year. Kind of tapered off. Of course, he was injured the last four games of the season. As a redshirt freshman, made an impact this year. I'll be interested to see if he can continue to build, if there's more there, because uh, he, he was I, one of the surprise players I, early I in the season. I think one of the things that I saw with Glover is he's got a lot of ability, and he can be really good. But he's got to run consistent routes, and he's got to run them at the right depths, and he's got to, you know, like those type of things. And I, and I think – the accountability factor. That's one of the things where I think sometimes Courtney Hawkins as a wide receivers coach with today's athlete uh, can sometimes not like the way he coaches, but it's all about doing the right thing and doing your job. And uh, if, if, if Jerron Glover can take that kind of step and become a consistent route runner, you know, the way that Courtney Hawkins has pushed a lot of guys over the years to become, uh, he's going to be a, he's going to be a very very good player, especially if he has a consistent quarterback. All right, we'll keep an eye on that portal. We're covering that over at SpartanMag.com. It's it's football season all the time, Paul, as you know, and uh, we can we, I, can we I put say a lot one of time. more thing on the portal. No, no, you cannot. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, some of these things, I, I get a million texts per day of guys. As soon as a guy puts up 600 yards receiving in the MAC, and everyone, you know, and, and I'm not talking about any specific player. 600 yards receiving, three or four touchdowns. People are like, ooh, can we get them? It's like, you know, it's like window shopping. And it's like uh, there's guys on the roster that have done that in the Big Ten, uh, you know, like a Montori Foster or whatever. And so I think I understand why people get excited about certain guys. And and, and I think, you know, the guys that Michigan State has brought, have brought in are, are going to be good players. I love the Sheffield kid they brought in from Purdue. He fits, and, he's, mm-hmm. and, he, and he is an established guy. He's someone to get excited about. But, um, you know, guys like – there's some guys out there right now that are people are hyping right now, whether it's a receiver or running back, and it's like, okay, there's some red flags with some of these guys. Just because someone did it in the MAC doesn't mean they can do it at, at Michigan State, um, and sometimes that's not necessarily true. But I do like the way that Jonathan Smith and his staff do their homework, and uh, they're not. It's, there's not going to be any. Um, there's not going to be any impulse buys with this group. It's not like everyone's telling us we should draft Darko Milicic, so we're going to draft him because that's what everyone said. These guys trust their evaluation, mm-hmm. and they understand and know what they want uh, for their program moving forward, and they're going to be very specific with their recruiting efforts. And, and I laud them. And the transfers that they have had uh, gotten have had, in some instances, a lot of ties to the area. Mm-hmm. I like that too. Um, you got to do something to, you know, the whole connected aspect. I like in-state guys coming back. I like that. You don't want a third-string freshman corner from Arizona coming to the program, or twenty of them? No, not really. Uh-huh. And I don't, I don't, I don't think these guys are going to waste money on, um, you know, on prospects from California just to get a quote top twenty-five recruiting ranking, mm-hmm. uh, just because that's what they need to do to to save face. Mm-hmm. And uh, these guys are going to be like, you know, that's one thing I appreciate about Mark D'Antonio, even the classes that weren't ranked really highly. Um, 
they went after guys that they needed. They didn't go after guys that would enhance their ranking. And they were I mean, pragmatic about needs and right and resources, and they weren't wasteful. These mm -hmm. guys are. I think the one thing I would say about Jonathan Smith in terms of being a per personal guy, he's also fits that stewardship model, and uh, and a lot of people don't like that. A lot of people don't like that um, stewardship model. They want someone who's brash and and you know and talks a good game. I want someone that does it on the field and believes in what they're doing and doesn't need to be extremely loud all the time and tell everyone he's right. I, I, okay, for the record, I do like a lot of Mac. I, I like people. Mac Portal people too, but I'm not like like a guy like a guy that went. Let's say a guy started out in the Big Ten, did not do well in the Big Ten, goes into the Mac, and plays in a system where they have a lot of wide receivers and they've got a quarterback that can run. And and let's say he um, has a resurrects his career a little bit down there. That guy, in my opinion, isn't necessarily going to be better than the guy you have on your roster already. Right. That guy's not going to be as good as Nate Carter, in my opinion. You know, so I've got nothing against MAC players. Mm -hmm. I would much rather see MAC players on the rise mm -hmm. come into the Big Ten, especially when it's a linebackers, defensive linemen, offensive linemen. I'm mm -hmm. all about that. Mm -hmm. But in terms of skill guys who I've already seen in the Big Ten or something like that, or at another Power Five conference, um, I don't think those guys they, are. They need, those guys to. aren't automatics. You get a vet. You don't need any Jarek Broussards coming into Michigan State. You don't need to pay six figures for Jarek Broussard, who's going to get four string running back reps. That's mm -hmm. my that's my take on that. There, uh, there's that Cephas kid from Kent State that went to the Big Ten this year. And did okay. I like that kid? But but for the for the most part, you're right. And the the, the big men is where it's at. And offensive linemen, there are some of those in the MAC Conference USA. The Dunnigan guy coming in second team. These all conference guys in the mid major level. If you uh, get like guys like Jacoby Winman, Jacoby Winman, or you know, and I, even guys like even guys like Aaron Brule. Um, you know, if you do your, if you do your homework on that, and you understand why he wants to come in. Mm -hmm. And uh, and whatnot. That I'm fine with that, but I'm not. I'm not fine with. I'm not fine with the the guy going to his third or fourth school. That's a red flag all all day long. I don't care. Like if you if you're in your if you're a defensive lineman, you're going to your third school. Uh, the odds of you, you know, working out are, are minimal. You're you're in scavenger mode then. And Michigan State's it's not really in scavenger. Yeah, it's the discard the pile. Rod. And Michigan State's doing a good job this year. The portal thus far. Jacoby Winman. We've uh, we're keeping an eye on that. A lot of good indications that he's going to be coming back to Michigan I love State. That kid. Some more needs to be ironed out there to make that happen. But um, a guy with a lot of leadership ability that wants to be at Michigan State, they're going to, we're going to get that straightened out. That would be a big one. Also, move him in there with Turner, and you know Jordan Hall coming back, and of course Cal Halliday still out there. I assume he's coming back. We've not heard anything. Um, I'm assuming he will be, but that's a healthy situation there. Potentially at linebacker if Winman comes back, we will continue to cover it. Anything else? Just the other thing with the linebackers, I, I really think that Joe Ross is a linebacker friendly coach. It, just watching the, the clips and you going back, they had the Minnesota last couple right before their bowl game. They had like some replays of some you know Minnesota classic games the last couple of years, and I'm just watching their linebackers play. And, and I think Michigan State's got good linebacker talent. And I think these guys will be in better position to make plays um, and make better reads and that type of thing. And I really like what he does with linebackers. I think it's going to be a good deal for the linebackers having Joe Rossi as defensive coordinator. I agree. Did you watch 55, Mariano? Yeah. He was, he was good. He, was he reminded me of Max Bullitt when I watched Minnesota the year before. And he, he's coaching with the Gophers now. But he was a Rossi guy and did a good job with that as the cornerstone of the, of the good Minnesota defenses. Not this year, but the two previous years. Anything else, Paul? For Paul Conerdike, my name is Jim Comper. You've been watching the VCast from Van Andel Arena in Grand Rapids at the Great Lakes Invitational for SpartanMag.com.